Five minutes, is that okay? You want short or no? Uh, 45 minutes. Sounds good. Yeah, you would. Well, you would just introduce you. Yeah. Yeah, do you All right. So, thank you for uh, your patience. Uh, so, we can get started. So, it is my uh, quick pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Fabian Sias. So, uh, Dr. Sias received his double PhD degrees in physics and computer science in early 2000. Currently, he's a head of the Institute of Computational Biology at uh, Helmholtz uh, Munich and full professor at the Technical University of uh, Munich. He's holding a chair in uh, mathematical modeling of uh, biological systems. Uh, since 2018, he's a coordinator of the Munich School for Data Science. And since 2019, he's a director of uh, Helmholtz Artificial Intelligence Cooperation Unit, abbreviated uh, as uh, Helmholtz AI. Is uh, involved and coordinates several relevant networks, including the single cell omics network Germany. Uh, Dr. Thias' main research is focused on application of machine learning methods to biological questions, in particular as a means of modeling cell heterogeneities on the basis of single cell analysis and also of integrating omics data into systems of medicine approaches. Uh, so Dr. Thias has a high H index of 97 and an astonishing citation count of over 43,000. Uh, so just to name a few, uh, Dr. Sias has developed one of the mostly used uh, toolkits for single cell analysis called a, a scan pipe. Uh, probably a lot of you guys uh, also, including my lab members are been using uh, his uh, toolkit. Uh, so it's a very scalable to millions of cells and it's easy to uh, use, has easy, easy to use interface uh, with the mach uh, advanced machine learning packages. So just a, a scan type paper alone has citation over 2,300. Uh, so recently he developed also another toolkit called the squid pie, which is for a, a spatial transcriptomics. And he also co-developed uh, SC power, which is an R package to enable power analysis of uh, multi-sample single cell uh, experiments. So Dr. Fias is a pioneer in using deep learning methods to model single cell genomic data. Uh, to name a few, he developed a denoising autoencoder for modeling single cell RNA seq data published in Nature Communication in 2019, a variational autoencoder called SCGEN to predict single cell perturbation responses published in Nature Methods in 2019 as well, and a transfer learning uh, framework for uh, called the SC Arches to leverage atlas level single cell reference data to model single cell data from patients with the COVID 19 uh, conditions. We're probably going to hear more details in his talk. Uh, today. Uh, his Nature Review genetic paper titled Deep Learning, a New Computational Modeling Techniques for Genomics in 2019, and the Recent Perspective on Machine Learning for Perturbation Single Cell Omics, published in Cell Systems in 2021, provide an in-depth view of state-of-the-art field of, and challenges to be addressed in the years ahead. So with uh, further ado, uh, please join me. Welcome to uh, Dr. Thias for his wonderful talk. I really look forward to it. Thank you very much. Like this? Yeah, that's what that's perfect. So, yeah. yeah, thanks for having me. This is fantastic to be at an in person talk. I think my Zoom to person talk ratio is something like 10 to 1 or so. And I'm not sure if that counts now as a hybrid. This is a hybrid. <laughs> but yeah, it's great, it's great seeing you. I think it's great to be in person. We just had this biggest. Uh, so sort of the, the main conference for single cell genomics happening last week, single cell genomics, this time at Utrecht, so it goes back and forth between US and, and Europe. And there's been so, so, so many exciting directions of development in, in that field. I, you know, I, I, I didn't exactly know the audience, so I was thinking I'd just show you a little bit what we do in general, maybe a little motivate why this sort of Atlas learning is a thing that you could potentially use for your research and maybe also know a few more method and client person then adapt this as a, a specific uh, situation. I'm actually here for not only that talk, but because we also, from the Helmholtz Association, and this is sort of my, 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 my host place, um, we, are, we are visiting the, is there some way that I could actually get, go get this over down here? Oh, it's fine. It's a bit like that. So we are, we are visiting both now McGill today and, and Mila tomorrow, and we have an interaction 
on the AI part with me to actually on that called Causal Cell Dynamics, where we go back and forth and interact with those. And it's actually a uh, postdoc and a student of mine visiting uh, here as well. So if you want to chat with them and get into interactions, that would be nice. Because I think the main thing, and this is what I, what I told to those guys, and I'm sure you get maybe your boss have said the same thing. After those two years, you might, might not have actually really yet noticed how much fun science can be. So now go out and talk to and, and, and visit people. I hope you have done, I've been doing this already. So um, let, let me get started now with this thing now. So that knows what I want to do. I just want to briefly say one slide about the place I'm from, this is Hamilton Computational Health Center. <clears throat> so this is what we this is this is this is what we do. We're interested in, in, in genomics imaging and health AI, and then also this, this large, larger thing of systems medicine. There's like click like that. And this, do you have a clicker that I can use because this one doesn't seem to do the job? I forgot to yeah. Anyone picker? I hope it's close. No, I just like stand. So, so this, 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 this is this is where we're from. Yeah, we are. Awesome. Yeah, so, I'll, I'll maybe you the first. Yeah, exactly. Do you guys know this thing? <laughs> Star Trek. <laughs> anyone? Tricorder, right? Do you remember? Uh, uh, what's it called? Leonard McCoy. Jeremy Colin Pille, what was this what was calling his like short name, whatever. The doc, Star Trek. In any case, he has like this machine, and this is from a 80s show, a 70s show, whatever, that essentially uh, lets you directly diagnose an injured crew member of that uh, spaceship, but then also to predict what's going on and potentially also sort of give advice towards treatment. And that's one of the visions that we have in the lab of using these type of techniques. Maybe that we want to go start with. And this is something that's in our reality already, right? That we want to quantify state of a cellular system, maybe of an organ system, or maybe something more complex, and then uh, use single cell genomics, build an atlas of that particular case in a control case, and then sort of see how your particular disease situation maps on top of that, and then uh, predict potential statement or, or, or state of treatment effect. And this last part, that's sort of where we really need to have a, get a machine learning perspective in because that's actually hard, right? It's not entirely clear how these uh, effects can be modeled and, and how they could look like. And this is what we're trying to do. So let me get started. I'm not sure what's going on with the screen here, but well, I, I, I guess I guess you get, get the idea. So what I'm always fascinated about, and this is sort of, I think the general thing in the lab is, how do cells make decisions? These little computers, how do they take up signals and you know, depending on the signal, then decide whether they want to survive, differentiate, proliferate, or die? And anyone doing systems biology, more often that the general thing, this has been for a long time having the, the aim of trying to very bottom up type of model particular processes. These bottom up models, of course, are attractive, but they fail at the fact that you know, we want to decompose things into the understandable units and thereby potentially not uh, fully generalized and applicable to general situation. So what we instead want to do is we want to maybe try to perturb a situation and understand how it behaves under these perturbations. So this is kind of the, the, the general thing, what we try to go for. I guess you have a, a function f, some type of interpolation that takes a state of a current system, maybe a behavior under perturbation, and predict where it would go next. Right, for example, I here as his PhD thesis is about not trying to connect F with some prior knowledge, right? Or uh, what, what Hannah tried to do is then potentially use time series information to sort of contextualize this F in a more fashion. Um, here, here uh, a, just an illustration of what you can do with these type of techniques from a recent uh, perspective paper that, that we did for a big consortium, where you see now here um, cells sort of making these decisions all the time and potentially sort of over, over, over this, this trajectory, yeah, maybe then making the wrong decision at some point, sort of taking the turning point off to various areas where you know, things don't work out so well. So because we have this high set of resolution, what we can now actually do is we can now really reconstruct some of these trajectories. Right, we have now, now this very easily, we can build hundreds of thousands or of, of millions of cells. So you can, because of asynchronicity, potentially map them together. And then this joint mapping, then understand not only what goes wrong in terms of disease, but potentially, and that's sort of the cause aspect that we really want to go for, potentially and even know not only what's associated with this wrong branching, 
but are among these many things that associate. You know, we walk in typically 20,000 dimensional gene expression space. If we attack, it gets even worse. So you know, there's like so many covariates. A lot of stuff is correlated, but maybe pick out the stuff that's actually really driving that thing. That's hard, but I think an uh, uh, interesting and fun question. Let me show you one example of, of because I, I call it sort of general cell biology type of modeling first before I then show you an example for this uh, um, particular genomes case. In this case, uh, for trajectory recovery, let's look at this really simple process of cell division, okay? And for this, for cell division, we start to proliferate. We, are, uh, in this older paper, we generated data. We actually had a collaboration partner of, uh, looking into um, a thing called yeah, image stream type of analysis. So essentially take like a fax machine, sorting cells, but then taking images of those cells, okay? And you also had a fluorescent stain that was telling you about cell cycle state. And the question was, can you predict now cell cycle state just looking at the morphology of those cells? How much information is there? Do we need another marker or something like that? This was a collaboration with the broad, and I don't think you can see this, this, my, my, my things down there, my, the citations down there. Is there, is there some way that I can kind of get this thing here to go away? Yeah, that would be cool, man. If you just snow it on the Mac. Yeah. Sorry, if you don't mind. Now, you want me to see you. What? I tell you, man. I tell you. No. The full screen. No. Oh, you think it doesn't go well, man? Yeah. Well, so I, I just continue talking. So it's like, like okay. But well, you're right. The chat was so nobody used the chat for the next hour. <laughs> oh, not... So, so what you what you see here in uh, in, in this first thing, we, we really had like a simple classifier. We kind of could predict cell cycle state, but then we used a in this case, convolutional deep neural network. So you were just mentioning a new network. So this, of course, we're going to be using for things on a single minute. But in this case, you know, just feed it through a bunch of layers. And then we visualize the last layer, you know, the last layer, we actually want to have a linear classification. And uh, for this classification, we actually did not use cell cycle progression information. So not the order effects, just the categorization fact. But what's interesting, your prediction works very well. But now here, you can also visualize this process. And here, it's a bit jiggy because of the, the wireless, but I think you can get the idea. So what you see here is each of those cells now are not yet trained and it just sort of forms this big blob of things where it has been trained. Now with dots, you see the different colors. Now you observe the network during training. So you really observe the process of these things of trying to separate and do the classification. You can see that it starts arranging things according to those cell cycle stages and classes from G1S to G2 and so on. I think that that's a fascinating result. You know, if we want to do a systems biology type of model, it was really, really hard for us to come up with a good description of these sort of molecular underpinning that. Uh, if you check out here, this is an outlier cell. If you, if you zoom into this one, it's either a doublet that should have been sort of sorted out, but Fox is not perfect, or maybe also cell from Taylor phase. So in, I think that's been classified Taylor phase. So you kind of see that you know, this process of this dynamics has been being mapped out well. And here you know, we called this at the time, I think deep flow, and we had a bunch of follow-ups, uh, then also trying to sort of arrange maybe patient by their similarity. So I think algorithmic wise quite cool, but it tells you about this idea of using even if you if you only have snapshot data, not a movie, this information by similarity and learn about the process. So this is what we're going to do. And of course, now we want to look at an unbiased description of cell state. So for this, we use single cell genomics. And this is an illustration a recent PhD student made. We want to have this single effect. You know, if, if we were just to look into bulk, it would look like that. So you know, we want we don't want to have average genomics. We want to have things. And one of the reasons why this works is. Uh, is these droplet-based assays that some of you might have already seen. Essentially, the, the cool trick is that you have this little, like, this sort of little small dishes, little uh, water droplets embedded in oil that you can deal with as it was an experimental dish and do your cell tagging, labeling there, and then just throw things together afterwards and do the sequencing. These, this are related techniques have been named met method of the year some time ago, has been followed up with single cell multimodal omics. You can not only measure RNA, but additional modalities at the same time. Anyone using ATAC or, or side something like that? Are you using ATAC on single bulk level or on single cell level? Do you quantify on the single cell? But for the analysis, very often it's still pseudo bulk, right? And that's, I think, an interesting. So I think we by far don't yet leverage the whole variation. Uh, 
and actually got from, from ATEC. I show a bunch of ideas for that, but I think that's, that's more important. And there's like so many other assays, of course. I think for protein markers, that's it's more natural. Yeah, and then of course, I, I think you mentioned already the spatial results stuff. This is, of course, when we get cells into context, we don't want to disassociate and so on. Go back to the microscope in a sense where it has been used to develop things. You know, this is becoming big data. This is from an older review that we did. But for us, from a machine learning perspective, it's absolutely crucial that we have these high throughput type of information so that we can really learn them so more, more, more complex models. And again, just for visualization, before I tell you a little bit about that, so sorry if it's maybe too naive for, for those that are really in the field, but here we fly through a 3D dimension reduced 20,000 gene expression space, and you see that those clusters are connected. We just label cluster by expression similarity. In this case, actually a paper we did together with the Lipid Lab, where we've been, uh, trying to see where, uh, how, how gut formation actually works and how they connect. And you see there's like intestinal stem cells here and there's some downstream type of cell type, in this case, and gender cells, and they're all connected by some progenitor cells. So just as you saw in this uh, um, movie cell cycle type of data, cells not just randomly fill up uh, ex expression space, but there's some structure. You can visualize this structure, you can sort of try to tear it apart, but I do want a computation to find it, right? And one of the ways that Quite a few labs, us and contributing to the branching part for the first time that we've been doing, is to follow now those pathways and learn those dynamics. You know, Ali spoke about dynamics. In this case, is obviously snapshot data, but you know, one of his aims, for example, is not to add also temporal information. And one thing what we did with this atlas, and this was a this was from GUT, so it was a crypt atlas. What we did is we learned then latent representation of this, and we saw the stem cells here at the center, but then we sort of differentiate out to all those progenitor cell types. We had this atlas, and now we used it on top of perturbation. And this is, I think, where the atlasing at some point comes in. Because we're gonna, you know, everyone has a specific question, you know, how does my particular experiment look like versus standard? In this case, we looked at mice from a high fat versus a normal diet. And we saw that it's actually decrease of intestinal stem cells. And this is sort of what we just found by a relative frequency so a population based analysis as aggregated from, from this atlas. So this was a finding that they were able to later validate. So I think this is the type of questions you wanna do. So let me just spend two slides on the analysis part before then I tell a little bit about this. And you know, if everyone is doing things analysis, I'm just gonna skip that. Is that still okay? Do you have a bit of joke here? Any feedback? Let me know. So yeah, what we do, you know, we typically start from a sequencer, do some type of carb matrix uh, uh, um, quantification, don't talk about the previous steps, some normalization, you see. Then the whole data correction part, this is sort of integration they're gonna be mentioned in a minute. We visualize these things. Um, and then check out these animations. It's been really working in the past time. So, so you, you then actually cluster those, 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 those cell types, you identify some markers, and you actually get sort of different annotation. And this is just for a particular example, but then this downstream analysis, this is sort of where we've been really trying to get creative. What can you do now with this additional variation? Right? We don't have just one in English, but we sort of see cells during the decision process. So the typical things that you would do is obviously differential expression across conditions, and, you know, even for that simple thing, you, know, you should think in blood, we've, we've solved differential expression really like 20, 15 years ago or so, DSEQ and all kinds of variants. It's like really working robustly. Well, in this case, actually not, right? Because you, you might have the mean staying the same, but you know, might, might have changes in variance and so on. So there's new things that you can test for. Then sure, you can do trajectory inference, or also looking at more complex gene dynamics and doing composition analysis. My lab has been contributing a bunch of things for this whole dynamics part. I won't talk about that today. We've been interested in, we've been setting up this SCV toolbox that some of you might have noticed, like take an RNA velocity and then downstream, downstream building a kernel based approach called cell rank that tells you about positionary states as well as uh, terminal states. We've been extending that. Won't mention it, but if someone's interested about dynamics, happy to talk about that later. But I think this tool side, I still want to mention. So early on when we started this first analysis that you saw on the guard and the related one, it took us I think two years or something like that, because there were no tools around. And then we, we set up this end data and scan pi and then downstream structures because really for us it was quite instrumental and, and, and useful to be then faster at this analysis. And we've been a bit lucky that this has been taken up so well by community. I should mention maybe this one thing here is fire, which you might not get has seen. This is a data loader type of thing. So if you want to benchmark a particular computation method or sort of want to get an atlas for this particular set of cells, it has a bunch of data loaders that very quickly aggregate samples from all over. It has been also harmonizing this. It has been, I think, for us, a very useful resource for testing things. All right. So single cell analysis, right? I'm sure you've all heard about the Human Cell Atlas Project. In some sense, a bit of a spiritual successor to, to the, the Human Genome Project. And of course, with map and so on, as, as you aspect, patient-related things. But the essential idea is 
you kind of want to build like a periodic system of non what elements that are cell types right, for the different organs. My lab has been specifically focusing on building such atlases together with experimental partners for the lung, particularly with the Schiller lab, which we set up with mouse as well as human lung atlas, and most recently building an integrated one. And I'm going to be talking about that in a minute because I think there's a bunch of quite interesting machine learning problems involved in that. But just to tell you that this is actually useful, this stuff. In this case, you know, when, when COVID started, we then used these atlases and, and asked, you know, where are receptor genes for SARS-CoV-2 actually expressed? So you can now, because you don't have a description of mechanisms, some of these simple questions you can actually ask. And then you saw, obviously, in lung, particular 82 cells expression, but then you saw it also in, in, in other organs, for example, I think in some uh, smelling-related regions of the brain. What we did here is now each of those lines is actually a subject that we had, and then we could co correlate or essentially sort of regress variation of cell type frequency because we have like a bunch of subjects where SARS CoV 2 is actually sort of more prone to potentially uh, um, 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 associate with because of higher receptor expression with a population covariate. And we've been doing a bunch of downstream models now of really building population variation into these models. I don't know, anyone working on GWAS or statistical genetics or something like that? You know, for, for, for these things in stat gen, right? So you're very used to mapping large, uh, large numbers of population variation. I think this is going to be happening on the single cell soon. Like first papers on PBMC and so on coming out where people have been uh, looking at thousands of, of, of people that studying single cell EQTLs and so on. And you know, here is one of these first ideas, and we've been building bigger uh, PBMC atlases along this line. Quite useful. I don't want to talk so much about that, happy to follow up later, but I want to mention a bit how we build a cell atlas. And in, in HCA, in our white paper, we just called, we want to build a collection of, of cellular reference maps, characterizing all these variations. So what's, what's the problem then? So typically, if you do one study, it looks like that, so find clusters, call those cell types. But if you do multiple, it usually looks like that. I don't know if, if some of you did these type of things, but typically, whenever you take your own study, just learning without any integration, strongest effect of variation is some type of batch effect. And it's typically not just the processing of the samples, but it's often also just the, the getting them out and like very early steps, maybe also taking it on. So you need to do some. This is in the field called data integration. It's actually for machine learning a bit strange. If you think about it, you know, typically in computer vision, for example, we don't try to regress images on top of each other like the same data space. But here it has become quite popular because you really want to sort of see what, what, what the structure is in there. And that's why we call this learning integrated atlas. <laughs> and if you have that, of course, the next step is, and this is something that's happening in HCA quite a bit, that we now ask, how can we curate that atlas? So how can we ask where my particular cell type, my particular <clears throat> my disease or so maps on top? So this is what we do um, for that. I think uh, a beautiful review from, from Raoul's lab, actually a, a, a fresh method um, was, using essentially curious sort of anchored on top of a reference and then doing also a transfer of classification of cell types and so on. And we've been, because there has been like a lot of interest in computation biology community with these integration techniques. So I think there's been now already 10 or 20 different methods out. We've been actually setting up a benchmark of this and a bunch of metrics that was just, kind of, uh, just came out earlier this year. And we've been also putting this into a challenge. I don't know if, if some of you saw this, we have this thing called openchallenges.by where we have a bunch of generate the data sets and you can compete. We had a Europe's paper last year and we actually have to follow up this year. Now. I think it's interesting to, to be more quantitative about the choice of that particular method. And we've been actually compiling a bigger resource of recommendations, how we think optimal analysis pathways should look like. If someone's interested in, we're about to put out the bioarchive for that, but we have an online book and it's supposed to become a bit of a community effort. So please just say, so the type of models I want to speak today about is, 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 is based on, on deep learning, especially on unsupervised deep learning. So in this case, you typically don't have very good labels for a single cell. You might have cell types, which is what I get from the profile. So we don't, we, we can't do it as, as, as I showed you with the images before. So what we instead do, we take this architecture here, which is called an autoencoder, takes a, a gene time cell matrix. So it has nodes, input nodes in terms of, of gene dimension, squeezes them down, and spotlight blows them up again, and then reconstructs. Why does it reconstruct? Well, because it tries to minimize the distance of the output to the input. So if everything was linear here, what do you think this thing would learn if the loss here was mean squared error? So you want to find 
optimal encoding here and you want to minimize mean squared error reconstruction. Remember, that's actually just the formulation of principal component analysis, right? Remember that, because you know, the, the, if, if you want to minimize the loss in terms of mean squared error, check out the proof for it. It's actually quite, quite simple. That you, that, you, uh, that you then find a PCA. So in a sense, it's just like nonlinear PCA. And these methods are really now sort of taken off at this recent Europe's challenge. Uh, actually, all the winning models for, in this case, uh, transfer between modalities were all based on some of, 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 of variation of this architecture. And what we do in my lab is now trying to add additional information to the slate space. So adding some type of priors, for example, knowing that this is different, very different expression profiles, that this is maybe ATEC and RNA, you want to sort of use that, you want to maybe potentially link, also you want to maybe use information from a prior GRN, things like that. And this actually in part works. So for example, we've been quite interested in perturbations. And for perturbations, we saw, and this was our, our first approach for that, essentially you have a control situation and you observe perturbation behavior of one cell, and you can try to predict the perturbation behavior of all the other cell types based on a few of these. In part, this works also for combinations. So this goes towards the direction of this perturbation effect that I mentioned. As I said, I want to talk about the integrated lung cell atlas. This is work by Lisa, a PhD in the lab, together with Malt, a postdoc at the time, now setting up his own show. What we did, we took, uh, and I, I should mention, this is a huge international collaboration, particular strong contribution from, from Sasha and, and Martin, but essentially the whole human lung cell atlas. In this case, we've looked at already 14 data sets that have been published on the lung, <clears throat> compiled something like half a million of cells with annotations. And then these annotations were complex. You know, whenever you, you look at the one data set, people sort of would call cell types differently. And you have maybe a very high level thing, just call it a PC, immune or something like that, or very detailed one because this is your favorite cell type. And if, I don't know if anyone's into immunology. So if you speak to immunologists, they all have their, it's like a big, big black book of, of cell types of this particular memory T cell state, something and so on. So this is, is complex and you know, people want to have their particular category. So we put this into this hierarchical notion. We added metadata and an automatic location, essentially build what we call the human lung cell atlas. And again, I, sh I should really mention this has been a big effort of also of, of multiple funding agencies. So this is what this integrated atlas would then look like. So what we did, right, we used this, we used this deep learning based integration technique. Don't say more about the details, but I can mention a bit more later how we use that. Then we see an immune part, an epithelial part, and an epithelial part. Because this has been integrated, we can now re annotate and we can ask how this hierarchical center annotation that you got from each of the study was changed because of this integration. <coughs> I don't know, a lot of these things are correctly annotated, but in some areas, such as here, we have an under annotation because some studies weren't just going as deep as you might want to happen in Atlas. And here's some mis annotations. So you can quickly correct them. Now that you have such an Atlas, I think a really fun research question is what do you do with that? And it's really not clear. You know, we've been thinking about HCA for such a long time in this big consortium, but there's still not clear how you very closely now find a, let's say, gene module or something like that. You, know, you should think that you find better filters from that, but it's actually not entirely clear. So what we did in this paper, we, we, uh, we had vignettes for how to recover rare cell types. It's kind of expected, right? If you have the highest cell numbers, you should find rare cells. But you can do variant cell type of annotation, so you can type of <clears throat> simple sort of GVAR type of association. We can look at the gene modules. In this case, which is clusters on the gene side. Or, and I'm going to talk about that, um, you want to sort of map new data on top of that. There's, a, uh, there's various ways how we, we bring this out. Someone wants to play around for us. has been really useful resource just to, to, to try out methods. But let me show you a little bit how we use this now to annotate new data sets. Now you have your, your atlas here, and, 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 and you want to annotate take this, 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 this new one. So the first thing that you would do is then uh, just you know, learn this one, then learn this one, then over. It would be just a tra traditional type of approach. Of course, maybe a potentially more clever one would be not to completely retrain an embedding, which would look different, but then transfer the first type of embedding and sort of adapt the new one. So this is called transfer learning. And this is what we, what we did here, obviously, in a bit of an artist's illustration where you see here a reference map down there, right? And then on, mapped on top of that in this, this, this red cells ADCs thing, which sort of map onto the reference, but maybe also go pop makes a new state. This is, this is SC Arches as, as I mentioned before. This is briefly how it works. This is a work by Mo, who just finished his PhD. Uh, has been really fantastic PhD, so very, very, doing very many cool things. The, the central idea is, you know, you take this architecture that I showed you before, a little bit different because we add reference labels. We want to remove reference information, so we tell the method about it. 
And the cool thing is you actually don't need to now for people to reuse the model, actually store the samples. You just store the architecture and reuse that. And then you can use this one to transfer now between different states, diseases, and so on. And this is essentially what we do. So you take on this network for new query. Now you need to take those query labels and you need to modify the architecture of the network. That's why we call it single cell architecture surgery. Your network adds now new information and you need to change that. And that's what we do here. And, and this is then also what we can share. We have an extension of that where you don't need to do this more complicated architecture and the thing and fine tuning. But at the moment, I'll just show you results of that. But someone interested, happy to discuss. So we can now do, we can now very quickly uh, uh, reanalyze new data on the on the lung cell atlas. I'm gonna skip that a bit, but just wanna sort of end by saying that on the final one, using this transfer learning, we had now more than two million cells across more than 400 individuals, and you can now see because now in this case we didn't only have control, but we also had various diseases. You could see sort of effect of of those diseases how well they were mapped, and we had an uncertainty score for that as well. So in terms of atlas usage, I think this is a very very useful um, effort, and we can actually show that this works quite robustly across a whole bunch of different sequencing techniques, so not only for 10x data, but also for drop seeing, um, also for um, some type of additional annotation with respect to surface models and so on. <clears throat> and there's a bunch of vignettes in that, that, that paper for, I think, particularly disease affected cell stages of fibrosis. So let me show you one more example of how we use this SCR just this late in a COVID study. So we wanted to map. Belf, so lung lavage samples on top of a, a reference atlas. And if we do so, we see that this particular disease, so this is, page, this is data from patients with different COVID severity, that they map not everywhere in the atlas, but just particular regions. So now you can ask, because it's an atlas, right? You can ask what part of the map is that where they map. So for example, this part of the map is actually macrophages. So now zoom into the macrophages and, and see what's going on there. And then you can see that you know, in some regions of the macrophages, this part is active. So for example, FAPP4, uh, CXC10, the other part, and you know that this one is then sort of marker for tissue resident macrophages and the, the other one for monocyte associated ones. So you find sort of a division of effects of severe versus, versus moderate. that has been, I think, uh, known before, but you sort of very quickly find this here with just mapping. And similarly up there, there's an additional a bunch of, of cells here and you can zoom in and you see it's CD8 positive T cells that they'd be doing different. All right, so that, that was the that was, uh, first part of the talk in the remaining 10 minutes or so, and, and you, you let me know when I, I should finish. I don't want to go over time. Yeah, I really I want to sort of be respectful here. I, I want to talk a bit about the extensions that, that, that we've been doing for that. And I think the first exciting one is now adding additional modalities, right? So I heard you guys interested in, in, in multi-omics. That's a bunch of approaches. We very often work with Nia's lab, uh, I don't know if you saw that we have this, this, this joint effort called SCverse, which we sort of want to have a more community effort of, of, of ScanPy. A bunch of people really active in that. If someone's interested, we're always looking for contributors here. But what we do here now is um, essentially go <coughs> for other modalities. And for this, we want to build a, a multimodal reference atlas. And we could actually use the SE Arches there. So this was a collaboration with, with, with me already, where we used his RNA and protein based embedding thing. Um, he calls it total VI, but you know, there's various ways of, of doing this. We can have a joint atlas on RNA protein. And then we could query with only RNA. So we could ask, where does the RNA only map? Because in many studies, you know, might not have everything measured. Like as in a, uh, I think in the future, you know, we won't have all the modalities always measured, but just a few, and you can sort of potentially impute with some error the rest. And this case actually works. So you can actually map the RNA on top of it. And you can see where those particular markers are expressed. So that's, was, that was a, a nice start. I've been following this up, and this is what we call a, a multi-grade. And I want to, and this is, so we had, we had the first thing published here, but I, I want to show you some new results now that we haven't published yet, where we now use this to also ask for adding a, a variation on top of it. I, I'm going to mention some. But first, let me sort of show you how this multi-mode integration works. So this was the type of structure that I showed you before, right? Input, output, decoded. And now for additional modalities, you just add a bunch of additional autoencoders. And you have to think then how you bring them together here. And again, I think also, also uh, Ali, you know, in your case, it might be different time points, but how to put these things here together. I think that's sort of really the crux. In this case, what, what Nastya used, this is, I should, should mention, this is work from Mo and Nastya. Uh, we've been using something called product of experts, which actually lets you also drop out some particular modality here. So what we did, and we sort of benchmarked things and compared things a little bit. So here we, we showed that if we compare two methods that can actually 
there's some some methods for paired integration, but they only work for if you have measured everything. In this case, you know, we can also have some dropout of things and it also allows you to integrate. But for the paired one, if you compare, and this was uh, here a bunch of these methods, we usually perform quite well. So it's definitely comparable with outperforming actually. But what it can do, it can actually also sort of help you bridge between data sets where you haven't observed modalities. You might have seen from, from Raoul's lab, he calls it bridge integration or something like that. It was a paper coming out recently. This sort of does that, 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 that for free as well, where you, know, you use, for example, you have here one thing observed where you have RNA protein, cytic assay. Here you have a, a multi ohm assay. Now you want, want to build a joint tri modal type of atlas. A little bit like dogma, I don't know if anyone has seen it, but you know, without just comparing it. So that's what, what, that's what, what Nastia did here. And you see you know, cell types look, look integrated. Now we query on top of that and we can ask, how does one modality map on top of that? And this is something that you can't do with any other method. For example, you can ask, well, would single cell RNA query would sort of give you one region? And I don't, don't sort of discuss these now, but you see that we'll be mapping to different regions here. You can also have a multi on queries. So you can ask, well, how would a combined RNA ATEX of more informed you give you to one region? You can potentially also associate this with the uncertainty. And what you see, and this is sort of the key part here, that you know, the query is nicely integrated across this atlas as you would expect. So it doesn't just sort of do some completely wrong thing, but it maps you to the right space. All right, so now we can build these multimodal atlases. What can we actually do with this? Yeah, and I should say we're now, now extending this, but this is what I want to show briefly here. And yeah, I, I really want to get your feedback there because this is a method we just sort of you now fine tuning. So here we have uh, patients, as well as maybe healthy or what perturbation you want to have, you sort of always think in this, this case. Um, but we have labels now, not on the cellular level, but just on the, on the patient level, the subject level, right? That's a typical case. In machine learning, this is called multiple instance learning. So essentially, yeah, so the typical workflow would be to single cell seek, do some type of essay and do a classic right, for predicting disease. We want to sort of really have a robust prediction of that, maybe sort of understand a little bit why that's predicted. So in, in multi-instance learning, if you haven't seen, seen this idea, what you actually have, you don't have a label per, per instance, per sample, but you have a label of a bag of things, okay? And then you have maybe a few of these, and let's say, you know, that these things will be healthy, this will be deceased, so Hannah, which one of the cells could be potentially responsible for that? You haven't seen the slide yet. Maybe the, or is it orange or color? I think it's orange. Yeah. So that would be sort of something that you can infer in this thing, right? But like, how can you do this in automatically? So this is sort of our idea here that you have you now labels for a, a uh, you have sort of observed a bunch of, 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 of samples here and you wanna understand which cells are actually driving that classifier. So this is what we do. So essentially you wanna learn by aggregating this back. <coughs> this, is not a, this is not a new idea. People in computer vision have been doing this for some time. So um, here, if you take a, Convolution your network of computer computation pathologists. So you never have the power to very easily uh, sort of add a whole slide, but instead you just work on patches, but you have the label only for the whole slide. So for whole slide prediction, you just do this. And you know, there's a, a, a te technique that's called attention based uh, deep multiple instance learning that we sort of adapt in this particular approach. Here. So what we do, and this is the architecture. So it's exactly the same uh, um, 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 mill or multi grade architecture that I showed you before. It's just now adaptive with respect to this labeling. So it looks a bit different. I'm still sort of working on the slides, but you get the idea. So what we do, so you have here for your multiple modalities, you have this thing learn, but now instead of just a single thing, you just have the whole bag here. So you know, we just don't only look at one sample, but I look at a whole set of samples that typically get the same label. And what we now do is pull cells from a subject, so from a bag using in this case, uh, an attention-based score, so it tells you which region would be so particularly interesting. This is called single cell attentive pooling. And then, based on this integrated picture, like your pooling layer in your network, you then add a classifier on top of that, okay? And with this now, you can now train the whole thing. It's a bit of a beast because it's complex, has potential multiple layers and so on, so not super straightforward. But you can also then use it to query. So you know you cannot take this classifier, go to a new situation, just map on top of that. So you can actually share, share this one. And now it's sort of, sort of a, in a sense, it's a bit of a multi-scale thing, right? Because it gives you sort of cellular resolution, but it gives you also these sort of fancy big labels on top of that. And that's actually working out. So in this case, uh, we've been putting together a um, multi-scale, uh, not only RNA, but RNA and I think protein 
a model for COVID-19. This was a recently published one from, uh, I think, Teichmann and Hanifa Lab, where they've been looking across three different batches in more than, a, than 100 patients uh, across more than half a million cells. And now we add as a query a bunch of additional cell types, uh, patients on top of it. And now you can ask how well do we perform? So first we see that this thing actually does a quite good job. So above 70%, the TALS already can predict different COVID uh, stage. In this case, I think we have the C stages uh, as well annotated. But you can ask how it could, uh, performs against the baseline. For example, here, if we just take a pseudobot, so just aggregating on a cellular level, yeah, it works okay, but you know, pseudobot just gets us far as what you see. And you could also have something very simple, just like taking the gene expression, so really giving labels to each of the cells, and it gets worse. But what is nice is, you know, I, I told you that we aggregate information across those bags. So we actually have, because it's an attention-based mechanism, I don't know if there's any of you works on these transformer-based things, but it essentially tells you now what type of cells are particularly contributing to the, to the prediction. And then we see that, you know, this is not uniform, but this is particular regions. Now we can use this to analyze how our classes are actually going to see. This is what we do here. So here we have now both mild as well as severe compared to control. And we can ask which of the cell types this attention scores, we aggregate this attention scores for cell types just to make it more descriptive. Um, which of those are now actually playing a big role? And for example, we see here that in CD8 and CD4 T cells, you know, we see there's actually an increase of these with severity, which is what you would expect. And we have sort of this slight division that we only have also early and late because we have temporal aspect to this. So we see an increase with severity here. We see that the B cells, there's actually also an increase uh, across severity, which is known because in different beta is sort of a big thing in, in, in B cells and it should be sort of worse in, 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 in severe cells. And in the early one, that's quite interesting. This, this is one effect here that these INC2 cells are actually depleted here. And we were thinking, you know, obviously we cannot not, not fully prove this because this would need uh, a perturbation experiment. Uh, we see that this potentially reduced ILC cell proportion could be linked to a decrease in survival, which is known for patients that have already uh, severe uh, COVID. All right. So this is a summary. With this multigrade, we can do multiple. We can do first a data integration, but then we can also do this multiple instance learning across uh, multimodal data sets. And I think what we're kind of doing, we're going to pick up PNC data sets, but I think this can be a really exciting way how we use these atlases, right? That we now have all this iteration, not things. Right in, in the last now, literally just five minutes, I, I just want to briefly now go to the spatial case and just sort of show you highlight of, of two, two papers that are about to come out, but maybe one is out, but just, just connect. And I think it's nice to think about, maybe take a step back how you know, this field started and where we're going to. So I actually worked on microscopy image before we had seen the cell genomics. So we've been obviously asking about cell variation on pictures. This is sort of how cells have been found, right? And then it has been this, this omics biology, and this is a beautiful review from Alex von Udenaden, uh, actually written by, by Jan Philipp Juncker, which is called Every Cell is Special. I like it a lot. Very, very, how do you want to say, sort of diversity acknowledging something like that. Uh, an old paper, but what, what they observed is, you know, the omics biology has been around for a long time. This is essentially the whole biochemical approach, right? And then over time, you know, with these assays, we have arrived at a thing where we can now monitor many genes and many single cells. And this was sort of state, I mean, this was what, eight years ago. But then, you know, things came along such as spatial transcriptomics. Nowadays, the hotter thing actually being fish-based assay, right? But we can really go even a subset of resolution of what happened. What do we do with these spatial assets? I think it's really an important question. You know, we can see cells in context. We can maybe sort of map them to particular regions. But I think analysis of these things is, is not trivial. So we wrote a, a, a review, uh, uh, sort of a perspective a little bit on computational challenges of these analysis. This is work uh, together uh, with two students, Giovanni and David. David actually moved on to the broad and Aviv <laughs> moved on to Genetech. And uh, there we been essentially saying, you know, what you typically can do, of course you can, if you have such an essay, look at variation subcellular level and maybe look at morphology. You know, this is all additional information that you can't get from normal RNA-seq. But in addition to that, of course, I think the key questions that people typically ask would be, you know, what type of modules of tissue do we have? Can you sort of give additional adaptations to the cells that we have because we have them in a special context? You know, pathologists would say, you know, this is within the cancer or outside or something like that. Or, and I think this is exciting cell interactions. I don't know if anyone has been mining 
for communicating sound. But the typical, tr yes. Yeah. What did you use? Cell phone DB or something? <laughs> yeah, that's versions of that. We actually have a very nice implementation in ScriptPy where we use a bigger database than the one. But I, I think, you know, it's kind of naive, right? I mean, essentially, you look for correlations of receptors and ligands, or maybe a little bit downstream if you use niche net or so, it's a bit more fancy. But essentially, you need to average over, over, over cell types. You know, and now if you have spatial information, you can maybe ask, you know, do we find receptor ligand direction flows by cells? Suddenly, you know, it gets much more causal. <clears throat> but yeah, and I, I should say, uh, recently, I think earlier this year, Nature has been calling the multimodal version of spatial transcriptomics one thing to There's actually some papers not coming. Um, so yeah, as always, you know, biotech it drives our analysis. So we came up with this 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 uh, analysis method, and I, I, you you mentioned it briefly our squid pie. We I have very funny PhD students, so they essentially came up with a you know scan pie sounds a little bit like scan pie, and then they were thinking about sea animals. <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, of course, it means spatial quantification or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we came up with this toolbox. I, I don't know say much about the toolbox, but essentially the key component to that is now that we have spatial information, how do we add that? So do, you, do we just like take end data and put X, Y coordinates there? No, there's more to do. We had one solution in there. At the moment, actually, we're working with a bigger uh, microscopy consortium to come up with a format that you call image data that is sort of more flexible also for subcellular resolved image analysis. So if someone of you is looking into fish data, please contact us. I think we can do better. But what you can do with this thing is already now is you can, for example, go into an Atari and then look here into a, in this case, it's a vision data set of mouse frames sort of for demo, then pick your favorite genes, look at the layer settings, but then highlight particular uh, uh, and data information and, and project it on, on, on top of it. So you can, for example, now see how across those, 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 those dots <coughs> in your particular annotation looks like. You can then select a few and then export that information again back to, to script by for analysis. So I think for these things, you know, as new, new questions coming up, we have a bunch of spatial statistics already, your cell cell interactions so on in, in, in script by. So yeah, please check it out. It has been actually really taken up nicely. So the last thing in this case, I want to take the turn back to the deep learning models. You know, de facto computer vision is deep learning models. 10 years ago, completely not. You know, we, we weren't even able to put like names of what's in that image, and now this has changed. This is super paradigm changer with this flexibility of this deep learning models. So of course asking, you know, we have space, can we do more with that? Turns out if you go pixel level, yes, maybe, but these convolutions per se don't work. So actually the I think in our case at least more natural structure will be graph convolutions. This is actually also, what a, quite a few people in, in the lab work on. So this is work from, from, from David and Anna, and it's, coming, it's about to come out. But essentially what, what we will be doing, and this is my last slide, so just bear with me once more. What, what we will do, we just segment. And then we look at this as if it was just a, a graph of touching cells. You can do this in 2D, you can do this in 3D. But essentially, this is sort of your ground truth graph of just proximal cells. Now you can ask, are those two cells talking to each other? How would you ask that? Well, you can ask if this profile of this one cell has something to do with the neighboring profile, right? But because of them being already in, in, in contact, much of this variation will be first just driven by cell type variations. So what you, what you actually ask is, and this is what we call node-centric expression models, what we, what we take now here is we want to predict, maybe let me just show you this formulation that we want to predict the state of a, the, the, the expression of a cell as a function of its state as well as potentially a bunch of cells in the neighborhood. So this is essentially a model for a niche, okay? In the simplest case, you can just like think about it as a regression, but then sort of extend or, or decrease the niche so you can make those neighborhoods larger or smaller. And that's essentially the model of this. Because it's now a, a neural network, you can make this non-linear as well, but turns out for many of the data sets that are linear one first works as well. And with this, we can essentially then tell, you know, if, if, if you know, this one actually is predictive for this one, there needs to be some communication happening, otherwise it won't be predictive. And then you can kind of come up with this directed interaction graph. So this is something uh, that is usable. I think it's also sort of made sufficiently friendly. So let me know if you can try that out. And you know, in some examples, we can essentially learn directions. And what, what gets really exciting now is that for these fish-based assay, where we don't need to do conv deconvolution, things get much more robust. Because you know, in this case, obviously, still have to do conversion. Oh, yes, I did say that I end and I'll have two more slides on, on, on Outlook. Actually, I, I, I'm gonna, gonna skip that. So yeah, I, I just want to make, make it a plug that you know, we, we, we need this, this community of, of SCverse to, to interact. But I said I skip, so I should, should skip. So with this, this, I'm done. I spoke a little bit about sort of learning 
cell transitions, you know, super temporal ordering being one of the ways to do so. I spoke a bit about atlas level integration using deep learning techniques, building an instrument lung cell atlas and curing it with SC arches and then it's multi mode integration. And then there's also this uh, multi instance learning one. I think in the future, we really got to extend a lot of these things towards the spatial setting with more and more of these essays coming. And I did mention perturbations, and that's, I think, also very hot in a new direction, particularly the speed of perturbation. This is a lab at, at recent retreat. This is how Germany always looks like. <laughs> it's rather as nice as, as, as here. And I thank you very much for your attention. So, uh, questions from the room? Yeah, so, in regards to how you're building the atlases, yeah. so when you're selecting the data sets you use, do you just take the data and whatever data you think it comes up? Or do you have specific criteria? No. Yeah, it's very important. I mean, obviously, you know, this, this old saying, garbage in, garbage out, holds to some extent. I think the key aspect is that you cannot build an atlas without actually talking to the community, to the experts of that. So I think why this long atlas worked and why in some, some aspects, people have been viewing it a bit as a sort of template for how to build other organ integrated atlas is because we really engaged in a, this, you know, I showed this slide of all these people, the big discussion with me because, you know, typically if you just sort of go computation ahead, you, know, you can do this and cell types won't easily match and it would be sort of very high level. You might not match it to cell autology and then particularly sort of take maybe wrong data sets. Maybe, you know, this one, you, people know already that there was like some sub tissue missing or maybe some missing. So that's why I think it's important. And if you do that, and this is now happening on the healthy case in the human lung and the human at cell atlas, Across pretty much most of the big organs now, so you know these integration things will come out soon. And you know, Raoul has been doing a little bit with us, not for integration but for cell type integration at least. But you know this this is happening. But I think you really have to make a community effort to make good ones. And once you have this, the key question is how do you then deal with the disease? Should you just integrate or just map on top? And this is something I think is a little bit outstanding. So you know for that, if you wanted to let's say build a cancer atlas, so I think that's really more to do. No, no, that's a cool thing. So actually, really, I showed you for the lung where we now query map the rest on top of it. We really had to quite robustly integrate across technologies. I mean, I, I spoke briefly about perturbations. So you could think that you could actually learn a sort of technical shift that would map this, let's say, a 10x data to drop sleep or something like that, or potentially more complex maybe even work from organoid to humans or maybe across species. So people thinking about that. But well, that's a bit early times to really say something. But yes, so you could, in computer vision, this thing is called style transfer. Essentially, you take a picture of someone and then you sort of want to make it look like a different one. So you sort of map and you could do this with this experimental techniques. Uh, Philip, you mentioned that uh, I kind of wanted to take you up on your offer. You mentioned about maybe a talk about uh, an integrating temporal information. Yeah. So do you mind just getting uh, just a bit into that? Very, very happy. Quite a bit. So it would be nice to, to, to discuss afterwards. Maybe also get, get out another thing. So I think the, the early on, what we did whenever we had a time series information, say you have a, some, some development thing or something that's happening, you know, kind of just threw the samples together and afterwards color the time points, right? And you know, to some, to some extent, that's okay. But then this was, I think, 2018 or so, I was visiting the broad and Eric Lander together with Josh Schiebe and came up with this wording OT, which you might know. This is an optimal transport based map between time points. And we at this sort of near the same time had this thing out in nature biotech called pseudodynamics, where we build a population model to sort of see where things go beyond. So these ideas have been around. And what we've been now, now so we've been doing multiple things. So first we've been now really working on those based approaches to make them also multi-modal um, and really sort of really connect sort of in a initially not constrained and later you, know, you can also add uh, Different uh, omics information, a bit more detailed across model uh, across time points. And this is actually interesting because OT doesn't only work for time point integration; you can also use it to spatially merge data sets. And so on. there are some really fun applications of optimal transport. Bad thing was this didn't scale at all. But now we've been so we will release a toolbox hopefully by the end of the year where we really have a scalable implementation. It goes to millions of cells. If you're interested in that. Have you seen the trajectory in that paper? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm, I'm going to talk to Smita tonight. Oh. So she's she's in town. Uh, this is, this, is, this is a good thing. What, what, what was the main limitation, I, I believe, in trajectory net? Uh, 
I, I thought some convergence even just of, of, of so basically the, the key trick there is that you try to parameterize. You don't want to sort of learn the OT map by itself, but you want to make it parameterized. There's a bunch of labs now coming up with this. We work with Marco Couture, who's an OT expert, where it's sort of an, called a neural OT. There's various versions out of those in the that, that go beyond that. But I, th I think it, it's, it's, it's a exciting approach. There's a new paper, like a new version. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, that's Well, that's also one thing from uh, from us, right? This extension of uh, unbalanced uh, neural OT, and might be also fun to look at. I should show a bit of that. Yeah, I, I really like that question because I, you know, early on I've been thinking about that quite a bit. Because you know, we came from time lapse and you know, they just saw three genes. So what do you do if you see three transfers, right? What do you do? Well, you kind of see always this jiggling because we have we looked at it over time, so we saw these bursts. And there have been a few papers trying to quantify this a bit more. I mean, people argue that you can model burst statistics by essentially not just making them from Gaussian, but sort of including long tails and the exponential might catch up with some things. And there's actually some theory showing if you set up this telegraph process of being you know, open and closing, but you know, in the limit assumption, this actually kind of fits. So there's some ideas for that. How would that relate to clustering? Yeah, I, I don't think your clusters are necessarily, I mean, yeah, where does the variation in the cluster come from? Is it pure bursting, a bit more complex? I think if you're really interested in that, Maybe looking into a smart seek type of techniques where you really have full transcript expression and then also really high result might be a, a, a way to go. And I know that uh, Rick at Sandberg has been coming up with some more detailed models on, on that really trust point of adversity. There's some ideas in the literature where people use meta cell concept to essentially tell you about that this is sort of a resolution that you can't go beyond because of adversity and it's sort of aggregate. Not super sold on that. I think. Essentially, the whole concept that you always just work in clusters is by itself a bit imposed. I mean, what's the what's the ideal resolution? Why do we need clusters? Well, we need it because we're humans and we want to talk about stuff. Right? We need our categories and we need to have names. That's, I think, the, the whole reason. The fact that all gradients and branches and maybe more complicated. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, if you really want to say, say, let's say, have a differential test of burstiness or something like that, typically you should see it in differential dispersion. And there are some methods out for doing that. I think one is called Basics. Uh, John uh, and a postdoc, Catalina, who's now in, in Edinburgh, and I think but there's a few others. Also, you can test for that. The one thing that I liked from Rickard recently was that, yeah, I think it looks at a least specific expression. And then you can say, you know, because you know, if you just see this one alley doing one thing, the other thing not, and you know, they're not fully correlated, that tells you this one thing is just burst and that versus the other. So you can actually add these stats. I don't know if you look into a differential setting. So yeah, I, I would, I mean, for disease comparison, I mean, I, essentially, you know, this is sort of, this is one of the reasons why your clusters are a bit wider. I think the main reason is actually that regulatory networks sort of account for different reactions. You know, the, the question is, where does the, let's say, <laughs> homeostatic population of, let's say, embryonic stem cells or something like that, where does variation come from, right? And I think there's various explanations for that. One, one, one might be bursting, but actually also that the population by itself has been set up in such a way that it explores different regions. Remember, there's this non of high and low state, and it's actually important to have both. So there's some things built into those cellular systems that seem to be doing the same, and that not necessarily bursting, that actually really account for the system to be adaptable to something. So I think maybe because uh, we're kind of you know, tight on time. So one more question, and then I'd be happy to. But it's fine. It's fine. Don't, don't yeah. worry. I'm, I'm happy to chat. So it's really cool. I mean, I haven't 
like phys like physical discussion with students is really fun. It's cool that you guys are so engaged. Just a bit of technical question. Sure. As we are also developing the deep learning method for integrating single cell genomic data, I noticed that you use. Uh, just in the pocket. Yeah, I noticed that. You could have walked around. Uh, so, yeah, in the uh, bulky instance modeling, uh, also in the one of the multi omic integration, you use a product of experts. Yeah. Uh, so, there are also alternatives of a mixture of experts. So, I just want to sort of, uh, you know, kind of have some of your insight mm -hmm. about you know, what what actually is managed in product of experts versus a mixture of experts. Yeah, I'm not sure if you really have explored that fully. I would actually need to talk to Master about it. So I know she's been trying out the things. For me, that particular formulation was useful because it allowed me to drop out, but maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. But then I think also is 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 there other approaches of how to essentially count the one because yeah, not the one. So yeah, I, 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 I I'm not sure. So I'm happy to uh, forward that to the master because she's been basically the answer. Okay. All right. So in terms of the disease in the context of disease, let's say in the genome association, a lot of individuals, right? So often we need fifty thousand people to be well covered for some people, you know, uh, associated things. But then in, the, in your talk, uh, you use let's say one hundred. COVID patients, right? And then you have classification accuracy, uh, which is a pretty uh, sort of a, you know, a range uh, around maybe eighty percent. So uh, my question is, uh, you know, how do we address the uh, problem with the uh, overfitting? Like, where the model is very complex, where you have attention mechanism, right, associating a different embedding with the different uh, uh, disease conditions, right? So how how uh, what's technically how do you work? Well, obviously you want to have high numbers. But uh, overfitting the dress, as always in, in any learning part, you know, we have a whole data set that's sufficiently large to make sure that you know from we report uh, from on the whole data set, but we have to try to test it. So I think the goal is that it will be actually taking the same code as it's in GPT. Um, there is now you know, first data sets, I think we are currently working on the GPT data set with something like 2,000 individuals. So many other things to start getting interesting. There's a bunch of genetic mutations for some of these that could be used, but yeah, at the moment we need less as we would work with less. So I was thinking whether you use the cells from the individual sets as many examples, but then you just had to label, let's say, back on cells for individual, you just label the same phenotype, right? The cell. But that wouldn't be realistic because each cell have different molecular phenotypes. So that, that's a really important point. I, I was supposed to be short on that. So this is basically, if, if you don't think about the multi-instance, but, and, and Ali, I hope, I hope you're taking some notes because I think there's this the product expert one, maybe you can send a short message to our to master, it would be cool. Um, so, so what we did here, and I, I tried to be, tried, tried to try to be fast, so it's really short, but essentially the, 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 the trick here was, so we compared this to a really simple baseline where you really give each cell the label of the bag, so the disease label. As you rightfully say, then of course, you know, many cells wouldn't do something, but if you train a classifier there, you get sort of just reach 50%, okay? And that's known, right? If you have a multi-instance learning type of problem and you then propagate the bag label to the instances, of course you can, you would potentially do worse. And that's what we're observing. Yeah, so why don't we, yeah, so thank you, sir, thank you. Thank you everyone online.